Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, greetings to all of you. I want to welcome all of us here at Center Street Church, those of us meeting here at Central Campus, as well as those uh, watching from our campus in Northwest Calgary, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and South Calgary. I also want to say hello to our online audience as well. You know, one of the great privileges God has given to us is to be parents, so I'm delighted to announce the birth of our daughter on January 10th. (laughs) So after uh, three little boys, we finally have our girl, and so I want to introduce you to Aviva India Ramani, if you can put the picture. You know, our boys are excited to welcome their little sister, sometimes too excited, so we got to find ways to protect her. (laughs) You know, the name Aviva in the Hebrew language uh, refers to springtime. And in my wife's dialect, uh, Aviva means complete. So that's just another way of saying we are done having children. (laughs) Four is all we can handle. In our worship services last weekend, we had an emphasis on missions. And here at Central Campus, Pastor Kent spoke from Acts chapter 3, the story of uh, Peter and John healing the lame man in the temple. Kent emphasized so well on the role every Christian has to play in advancing God's kingdom. So if you're a Christ follower, God has personally entrusted to you the responsibility of advancing His mission. Today, I want to continue where Kent left and uh, talk to you about an indispensable quality that we need in order to be effective witnesses of the gospel. Uh, When I pastored a church in India, it was in the northwestern part of India, where the official Christian population is less than one person. And any forms of uh, evangelism and outreach can get you into big-time trouble. It was the Christmas season that offered us... uh, Uh, opportunities to share the gospel. So we would check with our congregation members to find out if they have any non-Christian friends who would be open to having a a small group come from the church to their home and sing Christmas carols. And we would go to the houses of uh, people of other faiths, uh, Hindus, Sikhs, and uh, sing and share a brief Christmas message with them. On one occasion, we were invited by a family that lived in a large apartment complex. So we were supposed to go into their two-bedroom apartment and sing for them. But the lead singer in our group had a brave idea. He suggested that uh, we sing from a prominent place in the apartment complex where people who live in other units can uh, listen to us as well. It was one of those uh, spur-of-the-moment decisions. And mind you, we were not uh, like the great uh, CSE orchestra and choir. We were just a bunch of young people with limited skills. And as we sang people started coming out of their apartment buildings, and many of them stood from their balconies and watching what is going on. And before you knew, almost uh, everyone from the apartment were outside. And at that moment, I felt a strong prompting from the Spirit to share the gospel with all who were watching. There was no denying the fact that God had clearly orchestrated this opportunity. You know, there are many times in my life where I have uh, failed to be a witness uh, for Jesus because of fear, But that day, it was almost like God took over. There was a sudden surge of boldness in my heart, and I couldn't help but speak. And while we went to share the gospel with uh, one family, God used us to share uh, the gospel with every family in that apartment building, making it an unforgettable experience for us. And it was a watershed moment in the life of our little church, and it helped us to become more bolder in our outreach efforts. I tell this story to encourage you. God wants each one of us to play a role in advancing His mission. But we need an important quality in order to seize those opportunities that God opens for us. The quality I'm referring to is boldness. Without boldness, we will be less effective in our witness for Jesus. 
As we look at the early church in the book of Acts, you can see a number of outstanding qualities in the early church. But one that stands out to me is their boldness. They were a courageous bunch, even though they were a minority. And would that be said of our North American churches, that people are amazed at our boldness? You know, in a culture that we live in that has embraced political correctness, religious pluralism, and postmodern relativism, it will take boldness and courage to be an uncompromising witness for Jesus right here in North America. The question is, how do we become such bold witnesses of the gospel truth? Where do we find that courage to testify to the world of the saving power of Jesus Christ? The Bible text for today gives us answers to these critical questions. May I ask us to stand as we read our text from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 22. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. God, we stand amazed today as we look at the courage and boldness of the early church, the power of their testimony, and how you use them to impact their world. And we pray, God, that you will do something similar today in our midst, that a new sense of boldness will surge in our own hearts, the desire to communicate the good news with those who are around us. So come and minister to us and cause these words that we read to come alive in our hearts by the power of your Spirit. We ask this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Let me give you a brief background to our passage. Peter and John were walking towards the temple one afternoon when they came across a lame beggar. Peter looked at him intently and said, 
Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And amazingly, an instant miracle takes place. And this man who was lame from birth, now in his 40s, receives an immediate healing. And he was running around and doing cartwheels in the temple courts. That was quite a sight. So there was a huge crowd gathered to witness this spectacular scene. And Peter uses this opportunity to share the good news of the gospel about Jesus' death and resurrection. And he does it right in the Jewish temple premises. And while Peter and John were speaking in the temple courts, they were interrupted by the religious authorities, which brings us to Acts chapter 4. Now, while this supernatural miracle had a great impact on the crowd, it had the opposite effect on the religious leaders. Our text tells us they were greatly disturbed by their message. Particularly the Sadducees, who were an aristocratic religious group that denied the teachings on the resurrection, found uh, the apostles' words to be heretical. And because it was late in the evening, there was no time for a trial, so they seized them and put them in jail overnight. But that action of the religious leaders did not stop people from coming to faith in Christ. The book of Acts tells us that 3,000 people had believed on the day of Pentecost, and now the church had grown to 5,000 men. When you add the women and children, you're looking at a staggering growth of over 10,000 people coming to faith in a matter of weeks. Now look at the next set of verses, uh, Acts 4, verses 5 to 7. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Peter and John were invited to come before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the supreme court of the Jewish nation, consisting of 70 prominent individuals plus the high priest who acted as its president. The Sanhedrin dominated the affairs of their time. They held all authority. They were the most compelling, high-profile figures of the nation. And you need to know something. Just a few weeks prior to this, Jesus stood before the same Sanhedrin with the same high priest presiding over it, and we know how the trial turned out. Memories were vivid in everyone's mind, and especially in the minds of Peter and John. Now the leaders were demanding an answer from them. By what power or by what name did you do this miracle? Now, do you remember how Peter had responded the last time he was questioned about his association with Jesus? On the night of Jesus' trial, it wasn't even the powerful Sanhedrin, but an ordinary servant girl confronted Peter. And Peter's answer to her was, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this Jesus. I've never met him. He's a complete stranger. Peter, who spent three and a half years with Jesus, publicly denied having any knowledge of him in order to save his own skin. But now look at Peter's answer. He's addressing the highest authorities of his time, and he knew fully well the consequences of his response. And this is what he says in verse 10. And know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Do you see what is happening? The Sanhedrin had put Peter and John on trial, but Peter turned the tables, and now he put the Sanhedrin on trial in God's court. And with absolutely no hesitation, Peter told them, do you want to know by what name this lame man was healed? It's the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one you crucified as a criminal, but God has raised him from the dead, and he is our Messiah. And this is not the Peter that you see in the Gospels. A remarkable transformation had taken place in him. Now, the reaction of the Sanhedrin to Peter is fascinating. Look at verse 13. 
when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The Jewish Sanhedrin were stunned by the boldness and courage of Peter and John. It knocked their socks off. Among all the qualities that stood out, it was their boldness that was strikingly obvious. And Peter and John were no experts in the law. They had no professional training. They had no credentials. They had not gone through the elaborate religious school system. They were ordinary, simple-minded men. The word used for ordinary in our text in Greek is idiotai. Any guess what that word means? That's right, it means idiot. See, our Bible translations are sanitized. <laughs> what the religious leaders were saying is, what do these idiots know that they can give a sermon in the temple court and respond to us in such fashion? But they couldn't deny the fact that these men were not shaking in their boots. They were bold and courageous, calm and composed. And the leaders took note of the fact that these men had been with Jesus. The mark of the master was on them. Jesus spoke with same boldness and authority, the same assurance and confidence. Jesus was untrained in the rabbinic school traditions, but he taught in such an amazing way that crowds flocked to listen to him. Now the very same qualities were being reflected in Peter and John. What was the source of their boldness? How could these ordinary fishermen turn their world upside down? I can clearly see three things in our passage that gave Peter and John extraordinary courage. And I believe these things can offer us boldness and courage today. Firstly, boldness comes from the Spirit. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. The Holy Spirit was the source of Peter's boldness. Peter had not taken a crash course on being bold. It was because of the infilling of the Spirit that Peter today was a different man. The same Peter who not long ago buckled under pressure before a servant girl was now addressing the most powerful figures of his time with an incredible confidence. If you want to be bold in your witness for Jesus, you need to be filled with the Spirit, saturated by the Spirit, overflow with the Spirit, be led and directed by the Spirit. Because boldness is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit's ministry. And the infilling of the Spirit it's not just a one-time experience. We clearly see in the book of Acts that there are multiple fillings of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit anoints you for special tasks. In our text, we see that uh, Peter was about to respond to the question that was posed by the Sanhedrin, and at that precise moment, the Holy Spirit filled Peter and gave him the words to speak. Peter in his own strength would have never been able to defend himself before these religious elite. But filled with the Spirit, he was able to do something that he could never do in his own strength or power. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, some of us today, you're seeking for a fresh, deeper encounter with the Spirit. But you got to remember first why the Holy Spirit was given in the first place. It's not to give you goosebumps or a tingly feeling down your spine. The Holy Spirit was given to make you an effective witness for Jesus. And the way we experience the Holy Spirit today is when we take a bold stance for Jesus and attempt something that is impossible in our own strength or power, then we would see the Holy Spirit come and take over the situation. And I can share this experience from my own life. There are a few times I've been to the mosque with uh, other friends from our church in order to engage in 
conversations with, about Jesus with Muslims. And before I go, I must admit that I feel knots in my stomach. I'm not the most outspoken. I'm naturally reticent. I don't like talking to strangers. I'm an introvert. And that is why I have to pray before I go and acknowledge my complete dependence on God. God, I can't do this in my own power. Grant me a fresh infilling of the Spirit to do what I cannot do in my own strength. And I can tell you, in every one of those visits, we have come away saying, I just can't believe what happened. God took over our conversation. He gave us words to share and open doors for us beyond our imagination. And it's not because we were so knowledgeable and talented and brave. It's only because the ministry of the Spirit is still active and in operation today, and He continues to use ordinary, simple-minded men and women for His glory and honor. Amen. Boldness is a byproduct of the Spirit's infilling. Secondly, boldness comes from our confidence in the gospel. Look at the response of Peter and John to the Sanhedrin. They knew who they were talking to, the power brokers of the nation. They knew how they responded to them would determine the outcome of the trial. A politically correct answer could have easily get them away. But their response was exactly what the Sanhedrin didn't want to hear. The Jesus whom they crucified is now back to life and he is the Christ, the Messiah. Here's how Peter refuted the Sanhedrin, Acts 4.11. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Peter was quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22. In ancient architecture, the cornerstone was the most important stone that held the weight and stress of the entire building. So this stone was like the foundation stone. And Peter is essentially saying here, the very stone the builders rejected as unworthy of use was in fact the most important stone. The religious leaders had rejected and crucified Jesus, but God had other plans. This Jesus who was rejected is the cornerstone, the foundation on which the church and God's kingdom was going to be built. And Peter doesn't stop there. He goes on to say in verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is one of the many places in the New Testament where you see the uniqueness and supremacy of Jesus in such clear-cut terms. And no other teaching has come under greater scrutiny, attack, and cynicism than this one. Peter is addressing a strictly monotheistic audience. And yet he declared to them that day that the only way to be saved is through conscious faith in Jesus Christ. The apostles were so sure and so confident of this gospel truth that they would go any extent in order to defend it, even at the expense of their life. Because their boldness was birthed out of this belief. And it is this supreme confidence in the gospel that gives us the impetus to evangelize today. No other name, no other religion, no other gods under all of heaven that offer true salvation. The only provision for salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Boldness is birthed out of this conviction which in turn becomes the prerequisite for evangelism. If this conviction is not true, then we are wasting our time sharing Jesus with others. Evangelism would be a useless enterprise, a futile task. But if, convic if this conviction is indeed true, then I can't think of anything more important than the mission of sharing this good news with others. 
Do you know what is the greatest threat for Christians here in North America when it comes to sharing the gospel? It's not being taken before the city council, being beaten or our property confiscated. It was true for the early church, and it is still true in many parts of the world. I believe our greatest threat when it comes to sharing the gospel is awkwardness. If I'm honest, that is my biggest struggle when it comes to personal witnessing. I struggle with it. Pastor John Piper writes in an article, I've done a little research and can confirm to you that there is not one documented case of someone dying or even being severely injured by awkwardness. Not one. You know, we are so hypersensitive about being awkward. And that is why there is this corporate inferiority complex about being a Christian that is so prevalent in our culture. Many of us would not want to put a Bible on our our office desk out of fear what others would think. We don't want others to find out we are Christians because we are worried that they would name us as a religious freak or a fundamental. We don't want our classmates or colleagues to know that we go to church on the weekend because that doesn't seem like a cool way to spend your weekend. You know, it bothers me that we have every other controversial group in North America that stand up for their beliefs. They are outspoken, belligerent, they speak up, they do rallies, they fight for their rights. And yet the Christian voice seems to be so faint and feeble in the public square. Would you agree with me? You know, if that is the case, then it's time for some of us to break that silence and declare to the world that we are not ashamed to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, let me clarify any misunderstandings that we may have about what it means to be bold for Jesus. Being bold in our witness doesn't equate to doing weird things. Breathe easy. This is a true story of an American Airlines pilot who came back from a mission trip and was fired up and eager to share his faith. So he had an innovative idea to witness uh, his faith from the cockpit of the plane on the PA system. Now, a cockpit is not a good place to witness to anyone because no matter what you're saying, the petrified passengers are thinking, become a Christian now because I'm in charge of the plane. Church, boldness doesn't mean that we do irrational things. Boldness is not standing in front of city hall and breaking the bylaws by setting up loudspeakers and preaching loudly. Boldness is not disrespecting people of other faith and slamming their belief system. Boldness is not about churches putting cheesy messages on billboards like, if you don't have the bread of life, you are toast. What a welcoming sign. (laughs) Boldness is not being rude or arrogant or pushy or insensitive. Boldness should not be equated with being loved, argumentative, or obnoxious. Boldness is not wagging your finger and threatening people with hellfire. You know, people who do such things in the name of being bold have done greater damage to Christ's cause. But speaking the gospel in boldness means being a calm and confident witness. It's about being a relaxed and natural Christian wherever we go. Boldness is about being ready to give a response for the hope that we have in Jesus and doing it with gentleness and respect. Boldness is demonstrating grace and kindness and a heart that is brimming with Christ's love and joy. Spirit-empowered boldness is not just about bold speaking, but it is also about bold actions. It is easier to put a Jesus loves you bumper sticker on your car 
you better make sure your driving standards live up to it. <laughs> That's what makes witnessing effective. There's a clear relationship between our confidence in the gospel and the urgency with which we will share its message. Remember, boldness is birthed out of our beliefs. And we see this all through church history. Whenever we lose our confidence in the gospel, we lose our zeal for evangelism as well. Now lastly, boldness comes from knowing Jesus personally. After Peter's response, the Sanhedrin had a closed door meeting. This powerful Jewish Sanhedrin started to panic. And what could they do to stop this epidemic? How could they contain this message from infecting the masses? You can see their perplexity. And the Sanhedrin resorted to intimidation, used their power to shut the mouth of the apostles by threatening them with dire consequences. Picture this in your mind. The Supreme Court has conducted a trial and they issue their solemn verdict. And they read out the sentence. Two insignificant fishermen standing before the esteemed court full of influential people. And here's the official judgment. No more preaching. Don't even mention the name Jesus. And Peter and John were not jittery or fearful. But with calm confidence, they replied, verses 19 and 20, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now here's a clear principle in Scripture. We are called to submit to governing authorities that God has placed over us. But when the loss of the government goes against the loss of God, then our obedience to God has to take precedence. The Sanhedrin may be a court with great authority, but Peter and John knew that they were standing before the one who had all authority in heaven and on earth. That is the truth they were privy to. When you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. The apostles simply testified to their personal knowledge of Jesus. You can threaten us. You can mistreat us. You can beat us and even crucify us. But we know Jesus personally. We saw him. We witnessed his miracles. We felt his love in our heart. We watched him die on the cross. And we saw his glorious resurrected body. And now he lives in us through his spirit. The reality of our experience with Jesus is greater than the reality of your threats. We cannot help but speak of the things we have seen and heard. That is the kind of evangelism that is most potent. When a person who has experienced the life-changing power of the gospel, who has tasted of the love of Jesus, has been set free from a life of sin and darkness and brought into the light, when such a person testifies, this is not a performance or a recital. There's no words of apathy or indifference in that person. It is an overflow of their heart which brims and spills over to others. And it amazes me that some of the most effective witnesses for Jesus are brand new Christians. Their newfound zeal and enthusiasm is infectious. They may not have all the intellectual answers to the tough questions, but they want the whole world to know this Jesus whom they have personally encountered. And it is sad 
that as we mature in our faith, somewhere we lose that zeal and passion. We become too self-conscious and we lose that edge in our witnessing. And I believe God wants every single one of us here at Center Street Church to be bold ambassadors of the gospel. You know, as we come to an end, I want us to do a small mental exercise. We've seen in our passage how the religious leaders were amazed at Peter and John's boldness. Now do this mental exercise on a scale of one to 10, one being the least. How amazed are people by your spiritual boldness? How would you rate yourself? You know, I'm proud of our church because I can think of so many individuals from our church who are bold witnesses to the gospel. They live authentic lives. They will score a nine or 10 in that scale. They lead the way. But I also know we have people who are in the lower end of the scale. And I want to encourage you. This is the good news. Boldness cannot be produced or manufactured in our own strength. As we saw, it is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And it's fueled by our confidence in the gospel and our personal experience of Jesus. The good news is God gives us boldness in response to prayer. If you look at the very next passage in the book of Acts, the early church gathered for a prayer meeting. And they didn't ask God to stop the persecution. They asked him rather to fill them with his boldness so they can continue to testify to the good news. Would you use this moment of silence to just close your eyes and go into a time of prayer to ask God to fill you with supernatural boldness to grant you a fresh infilling of the Spirit that will enable you to speak and not be silent. Just close your eyes and let's uh, maintain a moment of silence. God's Spirit is tugging your heart. You feel like you need a greater measure of spiritual boldness in your life. May I ask you to stand so I can pray for you? boldness, seeking for confidence and courage in our proclamation and in our lifestyle. God, we thank you that you give us boldness in response to our prayers. Lord, we pray that you will grant us a fresh infilling of your spirit even right now. That a wave of boldness will sweep through this place. That, Lord, you will fill our heart with supernatural courage that we will not be silent, passive witnesses who maintain a guilty silence, but rather we would be people who have been set free, that we will boldly declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. So Lord, empower us that you will open opportunities for us, that through our boldness we will be able to seize. 
God, that you will make us a community that's courageous and that testifies to the good news of the gospel with gentleness and respect that the world around us will take notice. Even as we leave this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the sweet, unfailing fellowship of the Holy Spirit may rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.